That looks like we're going live. The numbers are starting to roll in. And Dr. McRae, you can, um, whenever it's a good moment for you, please go ahead and, and share your screen. Sure. That looks fantastic. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for Grand Rounds. I'm Steve Foos, one of your medicine chief residents. Um, and I have the honor of introducing Dr. Stitzel before Dr. McRae. Um, Dr. Stitzel is an associate professor of medicine here at Washington University in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine, and is also the director for the Center for Cardiovascular Genetics. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Stitzel. Thanks so much um, for everyone uh, joining us today for the Massey Lecture. Um, it, it really truly is a pleasure to be given the opportunity to introduce Dr. Callum McRae as the 36th visiting professor for today's Massey Lecture. Um, I personally did not have the chance to meet Dr. Messi during his tenure at Washington University and, and Barnes Hospital, but his strong legacy lives on in our division today through both trainees he personally mentored and the lasting culture of academic excellence that he championed. Um, Pro Professor Massey was considered really one of the original pioneering leaders in cardiovascular medicine, and the long distinguished history of the Edward Massey lectureship is truly fitting of his name. The previous 35 Massey lecturers, along with our guest today, really truly represent a variable who's who of the pioneering leaders in the field of cardiovascular medicine today. And I think pioneer or you know, someone who's always exploring new areas is, is a pretty apt description of today's visiting professor. Originally hailing from the Isle of Skye in Scotland, Dr. McRae completed his internal medicine and cardiovascular disease fellowship training in the UK before coming to Boston for an extended research fellowship. He then followed that with additional clinical training with both an internal medicine residency and, and cardiovascular disease fellowship at the Brigham and Women's and Massachusetts General Hospitals. His initial seminal research discoveries are considered really some of the landmarks in the field of human cardiovascular genetics, but not content with stopping at mapping genes, Dr. McCray pioneered the creative combination of human genetics with zebrafish biology to identify the genetic and developmental basis of cardiac cellular heterogeneity, further going on to demonstrate that the entire transcriptional regulation program for cardiac septation is conserved in the two-chamber heart of the zebrafish. His laboratory has also helped to pioneer the use of genetic zebrafish models for phenotype-driven screens that identify novel chemical modifiers and has used these to both explore disease biology and move toward therapeutics. Academically, he rose quickly through the ranks at Harvard Medical School, where he's now a professor of medicine. He was a successful and effective chief of the cardiovascular medicine division at the Brigham before being selected as the pioneering leader of a $75 million research initiative called One Brave Idea that's focused on identifying the earliest molecular events in the clinical development of coronary heart disease. Clinically, Dr. McRae has helped to pioneer the development of subspecialty cardiovascular genetics clinic and now co-directs a genomic medicine clinic that spans specialties. He is PI on several first in patient trials, novel agents in inherited heart disease, and has helped to spearhead the incorporation of genomics into medicine at the Brigham at Women's Hospital. As I mentioned, I did not have the chance to meet Dr. Massey personally, but it's really been a pleasure to know Callum personally for what's going on to be, I think almost like 13 years now. Um, although Zoom seminars and video introductions are often quite impersonal, it's refreshing to be able to introduce someone who is and was a mentor and someone who I am now happy to call a colleague and a friend. So with that all aside, um, please join me with your warmest Zoom greeting and virtual hand claps for today's pioneering Massey lecturer, Professor Callum McRae. Nate, hey, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's great to see you again and it's, uh, uh, great to be uh, back at WashU, even if only virtually. It's an honor and a privilege uh, to be giving this 36th uh, Massey lecture, and I'm uh, deeply grateful to uh, Dr. Jean Narbonne, to the Center for Cardiovascular Research and the Cardiovascular Medicine Division for the invitation to do this. The title of my seminar today is Building to Learn, uh, Connecting Care, Translation, and Discovery. Uh, and I thought I would try and weave, given the complexity of the audience, uh, some of the themes that we've been working on over the last three years, particularly uh, in that One Brave Idea program. 
I have some disclosures. Uh, the most important probably today are the funding for the One Brave Idea, HA, Verily Life Sciences, uh, the Life Sciences arm of Google, AstraZeneca, and Quest Diagnostics. Uh, but as always, the single most important one is the one that you can't measure, which is academic self-interest. And we'll come back to measurement repeatedly during the course of, of the next 40 minutes. I was uh, deeply um, impressed by uh, Dr. Massey's achievements. Uh, I actually trained with uh, his uh, um, former mentors, uh, favorite trainees, both uh, Paul Dudley White and Roman DeSantis at MGH, Sam Levine uh, and Bernie Lyon at uh, Brigham and Women's. Unfortunately, I'm not quite old enough to have any uh, uh, contact with any of Summer Weiss's trainees. But I think the thing that struck me about uh, Dr. Massey was that even in the early 60s, he was really putting forward uh, the framework for computer-based ECG diagnosis. And I think uh, his uh, work in this space really has led to the electrocardiographic field being so far ahead of most other parts of medicine in, in data collection and interpretation, even if only uh, by virtue of the fact that uh, it is the only uh, phenotype that is globally standardized and already uses in, in almost every instance computer-based uh, diagnosis. The other thing that uh, struck me was that uh, many of Dr. Massey's publications uh, actually are in areas where I've worked over the last uh, 20 years, Wolf Parkinson White, cardiomyopathy in general and uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and amyloid in particular. So as I said, it's a deep honor to be giving this lecture uh, at WashU. I was asked to make sure I used a clinical case and um, I also am a, a big fan of uh, patient-centric um, problem solving. Uh, and this is actually the case that I chose. Uh, it's one from last week's clinic, a 54 year old, uh, it was actually a gentleman, but I, I left it gender, gender neutral because this, as you will recognize is a case that probably represents about 35% uh, of all uh, patients in a commercial population. Type 2 diabetes or uh, atherosclerotic vascular disease, a, a whiff of chronic kidney disease, uh, just above the BMI upper limit of normal or the threshold for obesity, borderline creatinine, an echo in the, in the um, echelons of 0.45 with a bit of LV dilatation, all as a consequence of some chronic current disease in one small uh, non-ST elevation MI about seven years ago. Uh, each of their therapeutic endpoints, I had seen this patient for the first time last week, uh, was close, but, but no cigar when it came to actually achieving goals. A hemoglobin A1C of 7.9%, blood pressure 135 over 90, and an LDL of 160. And you can see the, the medical regimen, uh, lisinopril at pediatric doses, uh, atenolol, the only beta blocker in common use that hasn't been associated with a prognostic impact in uh, heart failure, uh, Lasix and metformin, no lifestyle management, no mineral corticoid inhibitor, no SGLT2 inhibitor, no neprilysin inhibitor. Uh, and the management plan, as far as I could discern for the last three years, had been quarterly labs, an annual echo, and a biannual visitation, literally uh, a check-in uh, with no change in management. And this is actually a very common feature of most of our chronic outpatient disease management. Goal attainment in type 2 diabetes has been completely flat for about a decade, with only about 20% in the middle, 21% of individuals meeting all three goals. Uh, and the individual goals, uh, goal attainment for lipids, for blood pressure, and hemoglobin A1C are actually pretty typical, not just of diabetics, but of individuals in those uh, uh, general um, areas of risk anyway. In fact, uh, if you look at um, a Blue Cross Blue Shield survey from last year, uh, about 30% of individuals who have an MI or a stroke never receive a second statin prescription, uh, despite their insurance uh, in North America. Goal attainment in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, even worse. Uh, we looked in uh, our populations at Brigham and Women's, 2.5% of individuals with an ejection fraction of 45 or less were on optimal doses of all guideline-directed medical therapies. Translational medicine, I think, is also uh, plagued with a remarkably low success rates. Um, in, in many instances, the uh, 
major problems are the translational gap between humans and the models used to discover drugs. Most modeling is by analogy where genetics are not feasible. Um, and then uh, in general, what happens is about 15 years later, the drugs that were discovered and the models that are imperfect are then transferred back to human populations where ultimately there ends up having to be significant refinement uh, of the therapeutic goals um, in order to identify the populations who actually will ultimately benefit from these interventions. Uh, and in general, the, the, the fundamental problem here is information content. There is a huge gap in the way in which inter information flows from the patients into the system uh, for both management and for discovery and development of therapies. Uh, and the costs of doing this are so enormous that in common disease, it's becoming increasingly prohibitive to actually undertake any of this. So um, for my brief learning objectives, you can see I'm a very um, obedient student. Um, I thought what I would do is uh, survey quickly the features of modern biomedical science and clinical practice that limit innovation, identify the features of learning systems for both uh, for all discovery, translation, and care, uh, and identify the potential implications uh, of improved integration for biomedical science and clinical practice. You'll see that I, my primary premise is that most organ-based medical subspecialties and specialties are already an anachronism, that the tools that we use to identify uh, diseases, to manage those diseases and to identify cures are, are largely hamstrung by virtue of our information flow. And uh, one example of this I'm going to use is electrohematology, uh, which is a fusion of the boundary of peripheral blood cells and membrane biology. Uh, the outline I'm going to describe is, is down there. I think it's probably best given the time that I just move straight into it. So one of the, the classic strategies that most individuals have used in uh, disease modeling is systems biology. That's where, as uh, Nate uh, alluded to, I've spent most of the last 15 years use the zebrafish really because it's amenable to ultra high throughput screening in, a, in an intact organism and also uh, particularly um, uh, feasible to model for genetic diseases, everything from the molecular level through organelle cells, tissues, organs, right the way through even to populations. The nice thing about it is it also allows black box modeling. You don't really need to necessarily understand every last nuance of the mechanism. So long as you have the input and the output uh, conserved, you can begin to then uh, do fairly uh, direct uh, empirical uh, trials for both modifiers, uh, chemical or genetic, and also for uh, formal uh, drugs. One of the things we've tried to do is to focus on the unknown unknowns, which I think vastly outweigh the known unknowns in medicine, and also to try and build some generalizable rules, which is something that biology in general has sort of studiously avoided for the last couple of hundred years. What's happening in the rest of our lives is actually quite an interesting comparison. So in almost every other area that we engage in, digital systems are already optimizing those elements. Um, I won't list these, they're obvious. Everybody um, in the room or in the, in the Zoom uh, ecosystem will recognize in each of these parts of our lives, things have improved dramatically over the last two decades, largely as a consequence of uh, massive amounts of data being collected and those uh, data streams being used to optimize the performance of the systems that manage them. The obvious ones are airline safety, uh, weather forecasting, and fraud detection. Uh, but this is Uber's tech stack on the right. And probably the most important takeaway from this is, A, how much information it takes just to get a car to show up where you are. But the other thing that I think is important uh, to note is that all of the insight is, is actually upstream of the end users, whether the cab or the rider. And I think the, the thing that I've seen be a sort of uh, endemic problem in medicine, uh, particularly as we begin to think about how technology and uh, artificial intelligence can be deployed, is that we tend to always inject that information downstream uh, of the provider so that the provider is still uh, offering a, a high source of variability and a high amount of input. And that ultimately we need to be able to deliver the insights directly to the patients rather than in interposing uh, ourselves in that value chain. We have no real systems in medicine, and uh, I'm going to briefly touch on some of these topics. Uh, but ultimately, the most important features, I think, will start in the top right and go clockwise. You can start almost anywhere, are that we tend as a profession to ignore uh, decision support. Uh, we, there's, in fact, multiple studies showing uh, 
that it's almost universally ignored. Uh, we've done many studies internally in the Harvard system, particularly since we introduced um, a single electronic health record. Uh, the data collection and intervention phase is largely artisanal, is highly variable. Most of what we measure is actually manually entered or is process metrics. Uh, and those metrics are used for reimbursement. There's very little biology actually collected. Uh, the innovation cycle here is really generational. And it's worth pointing out that all of these elements that are uh, highlighted in bold are actually also major sources of burnout and deprofessionalization when commented on by the medical profession in surveys. Research and development, I'm not gonna deal with too much, but the reality is it's a separate industry. No other industry on the planet has its research and development in a completely separate uh, venue. Uh, our analysis is not actually based on the data. It's largely consensus-based uh, decision um, uh, analysis, rules-based decision support uh, is the dominant feature. And then our data scheme is largely based on us, not on the patient or their diseases. And most of the data that we collect is subjective uh, or semi-subjective at best, and often uh, highly redundant, non-standardized, uh, and filled with point source information with no um, metadata. So we've begun to test some potential solutions in the last few years, uh, and I'm gonna highlight a couple of them very briefly. Uh, one is to build continuously optimizing systems of care. Apologies for the very sensitive mouse. Uh, and then to build uh, clinical encounters that are uh, scalable, passive, structured, and continuous, that are not related, actually completely separate from objectively triggered professional encounters. So trying to take the stuff that we know we should be doing and executing on it, whether uh, there is a physician involved or not. And in most instances, we've been able to accomplish outcomes that are dramatically better than physician-led programs, partly because of the fact that all of the uh, elements of care that are not reimbursed can be captured in this space. Uh, we're beginning to redefine disease based on mechanisms. So I'm gonna show you some of that so that the data we're collecting in clinical practice are actually part of the same data source that you need for discovery and innovation. And then I hope that you will be able to see the, gl the glimmer of a uh, combination of all this with real-time analytics to create a truly learning health system. One Brave Idea's initial um, uh, RFA was to uh, create mechanistic insights from usual care. Uh, and one of the things that we pointed out in the original application was that most of the metrics that we measure in chronic atherosclerotic disease, whether blood pressure, glucose, lipids, or uh, the usual diagnostic tests, stress tests, or coronary angiography are all actually very late stage manifestations of disease. In fact, if you look at the ARIC data, 100% of individuals with type 2 diabetes when uh, undergoing CT angiography have coronary disease on the day of diagnosis. So diabetes is not a cause of coronary disease. It may be a cause of coronary events or a contributor to coronary events, but it's very much part of the same biological spectrum. Uh, most of what we're seeing is really late stage, even in the preventative fields. Uh, and so what we began to do is to try to do for phenotyping what had been done for genotyping by uh, genomics and to begin to build unbiased phenotyping that was really targeted to try and identify very, very early changes. Um, we recognized uh, when we looked at this that most of clinical phenotyping is incredibly sparse. Uh, when I uh, co-chaired the um, undiagnosed diseases application from the Harvard system. I was asked by the NIH to actually add up all of the phenotypes in modern medicine, uh, and both research and clinical. And there are uh, effectively 12,000 things that have ever been measured in modern clinical practice or in research practice. And the reality is that everybody on this call differs by about 10 to the nine, uh, 10 to the six of their 10 to the nine variants. Uh, far less the complexity introduced with a whole host of uh, downstream epigenetic or environmental components. So we need to change what we measure in order to even have the information content of what, what we're collecting be relevant for some of the common variations in genetics, far less the sophistication of the multifactorial elements of common disease. And ultimately what we've begun to try and build is a vision for how you could build a computable personal phenotyping trajectory when you actually talk to patients or consumers, this is what they think we should be doing. Actually, many of them believe we're already doing it. Although I would argue most of medicine is sitting out here in the far right and expectant care, uh, waiting for people to complain. Uh, what patients really would like us to do is before they're born to understand health 
and then detect the very first deviations from wellness. And at the moment, we're so far away from that that it, it uh, is actually quite embarrassing. Um, but nevertheless, I do think that you can begin to see uh, movements toward this in many of the elements of uh, modern innovation from the uh, bedside all the way through to drug discovery. Genetics is a particularly powerful tool. Uh, as Nate said, I've spent a long time in genetics and he and many of the investigators at WashU have really shown just how powerful genetics and genomics can be. Uh, when um, uh, we look at it, it's probably the only rigorous way other than massive trauma or major toxic exposures to identify causality in human disease. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I've spent a lot of time doing is working on rare alleles in Mendelian disease, huge amount of work uh, on common alleles uh, in common disease. But as you would imagine, what we've not done is really look at the large effect size or moderate effect size variants in the middle that are difficult to detect because they're either unmeasured uh, or there are modifiers, conditioning modifiers that are also unmeasured. Uh, so if you have a major genetic disease that's dependent on exposure to a common virus, for example, unless you know the genotype, the serotype for that virus, you would never know whether the condition was inherited or not. So what we began to do was to try and define new diseases that crossed organ-specific boundaries that were subsets of existing traits were relevant to human biology and had very large effect sizes. Uh, and to do it by really thinking about how we extracted new information from existing phenotypes uh, or added uh, perturbations to understand uh, latent phenotypes that were uh, largely undetected or undetectable in the current system. So the traditional ser serial process is to take a Mendelian, a, a disease syndrome to break it down into Mendelian disorders, to identify the genes, build the models, do drug screens, and then return it to specific forms of that condition. Common diseases are very difficult because there are very few examples that have the magnitude of effect where you can actually identify a uh, sufficient and necessary genetic um, variant. And so as a result of that, a lot of the animal modeling ends up being phenocopy based and a lot of the therapies end up being generic. What we did was to try and combine uh, a cellular phenotype and a genotype, doesn't have to be cellular, I'll show you some that are actually in vivo, but human based, uh, uh, phenotype uh, genotype combinations uh, that we could then uh, understand where they sit in the disease spectrum and in parallel with understanding that have already developed uh, drugs that have human relevance uh, through uh, iterative optimization using a variety of high throughput screening technologies. And I'm not going to show you any of this, but just to show you some of the clinical phenotyping and a couple of the outputs that we've identified. So what we began to do is really think about ways that we could discover and select new disease relevant and dynamic human phenotypes. And you'll recognize that some of these are actually uh, very clearly uh, subsets of known uh, human disease syndromes. Uh, we began to extract using AI a whole host of traits from uh, existing imaging and ECG data. One of the reasons I was uh, um, uh, so impressed with uh, Dr. Massey's uh, early work uh, to study existing phenotypes that are low cost and commonly used under discrete perturbations chosen because of their role in uh, nutrition or their uh, pharmacologic role in the first instance. But you can imagine on almost any uh, perturbation could be used, uh, beginning to design really new layers of this phenotype stack. Uh, and I'm going to show you some examples, whether it's OCT of uh, of the retina in individuals with uh, preclinical risk factors for athro, uh, cellular multidimensional phenotypes, echo AI phenotypes, or as I mentioned, electrical phenotypes in peripheral blood cells. And each of those we believe could then be used as a, a novel disease target. And we'll show you some examples where we actually think this is already feasible uh, based on some of the mechanisms we've identified. And then also show you how I think you can build systems to allow care to be delivered around this type of metric in a very efficient fashion. Um, so we started off doing this actually when uh, Nate was still at Brigham and Women's. We did uh, some very early digital phenotyping and heart failure uh, and identified that simple uh, orthogonal metrics like auditory evoked responses or stride length or even buckle smear biology uh, could actually identify subsets uh, of heart failure. Uh, so auditory evoked response is a really good way of pulling out uh, cardiac amyloid. It actually is particularly good 
because it distinguishes PTR from uh, AL amyloid, which tends not to penetrate the blood-brain barrier. Uh, stride length is an important uh, predictor of familial forms, inherited forms of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, largely on the basis uh, of uh, the fact that many of them have limb girdle muscular dystrophies that are subtle or subclinical. And then we showed in, in one of the publications from this work that uh, you could actually identify arrhythmogenic cardio, uh, cardiomyopathy cellular phenotypes from looking at skin or, or buccal mucosal um, uh, plaque of globin localization. So in preclinical uh, coronary disease, we began to explore a whole host of different phenotypes with the goal really of combining, not displacing bedside medicine, but adding uh, massive information content to those types of assay. And you can see here are things that we know already are important in coronary disease, and yet we do not uh, really make any effort to measure them in at any level of resolution. Uh, we wait until somebody actually has uh, uh, ocular sy sy symptoms before we end up looking at their retina. Uh, we wait until the aggregations of cholesterol-laden macrophages are visible to the naked eye uh, before we uh, allocate uh, them as a diagnostic metric. Uh, blood pressure responses to meals have been shown in teenagers to be very strong predictors of long-term outcomes in coronary disease uh, uh, victim relatives. Uh, and then finally, LDL cholesterol response is probably the best predictor in almost every setting in which it's been studied of your long-term risk of uh, vascular disease. But instead, we have tended to focus on the things that are already in place for which we can actually uh, um, create revenue or for which we have already collected uh, long-term epidemiologic data. And this is, a, again, I think one of the core problems is that the cycle in epidemiology is about 20 years, uh, whereas the cycle in almost every other, other industry is closer to 20 months. We've looked at consumer data. I don't have time uh, to really uh, spend uh, long on this, but the reality is we've been working on the Apple Heart Movement Study, which is now uh, based with us, uh, looking at continuous or semi-continuous data uh, from a whole host of sensors and trying to build these types of data sets in combination with traditional uh, uh, low-cost clinical surveillance tools like the CBC or the CHEM7. Uh, to try and build new disease classifiers, but also to try and train on internal outcomes. Uh, and much of this is actually uh, incredibly useful for understanding the discrete patterns of behavior. Uh, at the moment, much of what we're doing is focused on the COVID response, but you can see here that uh, you're, uh, this is uh, the March um, uh, uh, quarantine order that uh, occurred nationally. You can see here that exercise patterns before the quarantine order, the uh, uh, social isolation orders really predicted, as you would imagine, all of the responses uh, post um, uh, um, lockdown. Uh, but in those individuals who lost their job uh, or uh, had uh, um, no other uh, source of uh, stress or anxiety, except for the fact that they preferred digital entertainment, those were completely unchanged. The other thing that we noticed that was quite interesting is this peak here, for example, is the first uh, holiday after the new year when New Year's resolutions are strong, but there was a complete inversion of the exercise patterns from the weekends, uh, which turns out um, for a whole host of reasons uh, that were, are very difficult to interpret also to be the case in individuals who don't exercise and are just uh, sitting on the couch watching video games. So for some reason, the, the the behavioral uh, tools are shared in areas where the behavioral instincts are shared in, in uh, areas where in many instances, the actual behaviors are very, very discrete. We began to look at uh, a whole host of uh, Mendelian disorder uh, phenotypes. So we looked at very young children with atherosclerosis caused by uh, LDL mutations. We were able to show in, in, in fact, in mouse and in zebrafish that all of the uh, high, familial hypercholesterolemia genes result in branching morphogenesis abnormalities in early development before the lipids are abnormal. Uh, we've been subsequently able, and this work is not yet published, but is in press, to show that uh, there's actually uh, similar defects in the uh, heterozygous and homozygous offspring of uh, those with FH. And we're now actually looking at branching morphogenesis in large mammography data sets where we have serial data over a long period of time to see if we can predict whether or not atherosclerosis is related to branching morphogenesis. Uh, and a whole host of other ductal patterns.
Uh, what we've spent most of the time doing is working on cellular perturbations where we've used ex vivo, simple complete blood samples uh, in a um, single cell analysis platform or a global microscopy platform, uh, typically using tools that are available in every lab. One of the, the uh, morphometry uh, tools we've used is the Sysmax, which is used for 95% of all the complete blood counts in North America. Uh, and what we've tried to do is maximize the information yield from this by adding a panel of perturbations using AI to deconvolute those cellular behaviors. Uh, and then selecting the effect sizes that are large enough to actually have genetic effects. Most of what I'm gonna show you is based on literally only 7,500 patients. We've only genotyped 2,200 because we identified that the majority of the loci that we were interested in, i.e. loci that were large enough to be sufficient and necessary uh, for the phenotype uh, can be detected with only a few hundred individuals. Uh, and we've screened 35 per perturbations and selected 146 genetic loci across 375 novel phenotypes to study. These are the types of perturbations we use. So drugs that you will all have used in your clinical practice, the compounds are readily swapped out. So you can actually begin to think about studying uh, drug response in a, a simple blood sample. And we've begun to map drug responses of cells to drug responses uh, in the intact individual uh, for things that uh, are obviously occurring in very different cell types. The nice thing about this strategy is obviously it's completely scalable and the information content is almost uh, uh, too large to imagine. We've been able just using 35 perturbations and the standard Sysmex, for example, to create a matrix of about 16 million uh, new phenotypes. Uh, and we've selected only the top uh, 140, 150 of these uh, for further study at the moment. But you can imagine you can begin to do this in a very systematic way. These are the types of loci that uh, you can identify, um, many of them uh, with uh, p-values of 10 to the minus 30 after only uh, two or three individuals. And we've gone on to show uh, that a real subset of these are actually Mendelian uh, or pseudo-Mendelian at least. Uh, one of the nice things that you can do is you can begin to break down the dimensionality uh, of these large phenotypes so that they are truly things that could be measured in clinical practice. Uh, and in fact, one of the things we've begun to do is to uh, try and then use both the cellular phenotypes uh, and the genetics to map onto diseases. You can see here on the right, uh, a, um, a set of loci that were mapped from a cellular phenotype. The primary locus was identified and then we mapped them just onto straightforward uh, EMR phenotypes. This is actually uh, a, um, uh, for some reason, the, the uh, label on this has dropped off as a change of format, uh, but this is actually a cellular response to LPS uh, in uh, atherosclerosis. And you can see a very nice link with the subset of individuals who have atherosclerosis of this phenotype uh, and p-values uh, of uh, really uh, very robust levels with only a few hundred individuals in each of those sets. We've done cellular physiology uh, training uh, microscopes to follow individual cells and their responses. Uh, you can pick up a whole host of ionic phenotypes, uh, pH, uh, mechanosensing phenotypes, whole host of channels. In fact, one of the interesting things about uh, this particular uh, set of phenotypes is you can actually measure uh, abnormalities of uh, channel biology and leukocytes without ever having to do an ECG uh, and predict the uh, electrocardiography. Uh, I'm not gonna show you these data because people have already uh, publish this type of uh, data set for iPS cells. But the fact is you can do it uh, in leukocytes that are uh, removed straight from the peripheral blood. Uh, we've begun to do exactly the same with echocardiographic phenotypes, beginning to break down, for example, in this instance, HEFPEF into a series of uh, AI-based traits that are really principal components. Uh, you can see that you can map these very clearly. There's a nice locus here that is uh, uh, very clearly uh, related uh, to heart failure in a subset of individuals um, or who have an integral uh, um, a metric that's composed of eight different PCA components on AI. Uh, you can look at global longitudinal strains uh, quantitatively measured across large populations uh, and identify this is actually a glycosyl transferase. Uh, and then there's a series of obesity related genes in this RX3, RX5 FDO cluster which has been well studied in obesity uh, that are very tightly associated with LV mass in individuals who are not obese but have some specific features uh, on their echo AI. 
And the nice thing about these Echowave AI phenotypes is they detect the very high uh, areas under the curve, a remarkable specificity in subsettings, uh, a whole host of traditional uh, echocardiographic phenotypes. You can train them around hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or amyloid uh, and do remarkably well uh, compared with the existing leaders in that setting. So what we're trying to do here is to build a reproducible pipeline uh, that goes all the way from end to end from human phenotypes and genotypes at the start and all the way through to drug discovery. Uh, this is the top 20 or so. Uh, we have, as I said, about 140 from just from this one technology alone. Uh, we have five from a microscopy phenotype. I'm going to show you one brief example there. We have 10 echoes. We're doing a lot of other phenotyping with wearables and other tools, integrating where uh, at all possible with objective data uh, from uh, the electronic health record. And in many instances, we've been able to already build uh, in vivo human uh, models. Well, these are actually obviously patient, early patient work or uh, in vivo animal models and, and uh, begin to undertake uh, therapeutic screens for suppressor. Uh, this is one example. So this is work done by uh, Wandi Zhu, who's a fabulous uh, postdoctoral fellow who came from uh, John Silva's lab uh, recommended highly by Jean Nirvan and is really uh, an amazing scientist. Uh, she has uh, trained a, very extensively in electrophysiology, very quickly took to this uh, electrohematology work, uh, identified in an unbiased screen uh, that um, Yoda uh, 1, an activator of Piazza 1, identifies a subset of individuals in diabetes who have uh, significant upregulation. Uh, of their piezo-1 uh, uh, conductance. Uh, it's particularly uh, prominent in neutrophils and in platelets. Uh, you can detect it very easily on uh, flow cytometry. Uh, she then went on to uh, show that uh, piezo-1 activation uh, um, indeed uh, not only uh, bypasses the traditional platelet activation uh, mechanisms, uh, but also uh, results in phosphatidyl serine exposure, not only in um, platelets, but also in uh, red blood cells. Uh, this is uh, clinically uh, of importance in a subset of diabetics, uh, probably as, as many as 20% of the diabetic type 2 diabetic populations that we've surveyed subsequently. Uh, she was able to identify uh, in a parallel screen in the CISMEX, a locus in only 155 subjects, uh, that is uh, uh, actually piezo-1 mediated interaction with LPS. Uh, and this also, although it's a much more subtle signal, can be detected on flow cytometry. Uh, interestingly, the effect is uh, directly inhibited by a, a specific peptide, GSMTX4, which inhibits piezo-1. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that she went on to do was really to build a series of ex vivo assays for humans uh, which I don't uh, have a huge amount of time to uh, deal with, but this work is just being submitted, uh, where she also showed that in fully anticoagulated individuals, uh, there was a uh, piezo one mediated uh, effect on uh, thrombosis in uh, a variety of ex vivo stenotic microfluidic models uh, that is directly uh, inhibitable by uh, uh, the GSMTX4 uh, uh, peptide. Uh, the other thing that's quite interesting, she's gone on, and uh, this is a huge amount of work, to actually uh, use uh, both uh, zebrafish and mouse to look at uh, uh, trend, uh, transplant and shown that piezo-1 itself is also an uh, inhibitor of um, uh, uh, proliferation of basal states, but a dramatic accelerator of proliferation in diabetic states, so in a transplanted uh, um, cells uh, that are uh, piezo-1 negative, you can see uh, in this zebrafish model, the hats and the homozygotes are, uh, dominate the bone marrow very, very quickly. And in fact, uh, although this uh, is very difficult to detect without really high-scale uh, cellular biology, we've not been able, even with ultra-deep genomic sequencing, to identify uh, any mutational selection underlying this. So this is a novel phenotype-based um, clonal selection that occurs in type 2 diabetes, uh, and we believe is associated with thrombosis uh, in a significant subset of diabetics. So hopefully what we can do is to try and eliminate some of the translational gaps uh, by actually focusing on uh, almost global uh, patient phenotyping. The nice thing about this uh, particular technology is you can literally uh, capture almost as much information content as a whole genome from a single complete blood count, 
uh, and a few perturbations uh, for a cost of about $3.40 a, a sample. And importantly, you can do it longitudinally. So we're now uh, really pushing to try and understand if we can systematically move this from phenotype and genotype to novel intervention in a very much shorter scale uh, than has been possible in uh, drug development up until now. The last couple of minutes, I'm going to show you a very brief story about uh, how we uh, tried to re-engineer clinical care delivery. Uh, the core elements that we uh, thought of as we were building this inside our uh, um, electronic health record uh, were very quickly evident, uh, not evidently not easy to replicate in an electronic health record as currently configured. So what we did was we pulled the entire structure uh, outside the EMR into a smart on fire uh, based uh, personal health record that is essentially, sorry, uh, an AI based analytic engine that pulls out the objective data from the electronic uh, health record uses guideline directed um, uh, algorithms for care, and then re-engineers the clinical workflow so that it can be delivered by a, a non-licensed personnel supervised by a pharmacist in direct interaction with the patient. We ultimately believe this can be done through self-care, uh, but at the moment, the majority of individuals who are uh, true patients, i.e. folks who have conditions that need to be managed, tend not to be very uh, amenable to using automated, uh, fully automated care. And so we introduced uh, navigators, uh, college graduates who can help them uh, um, literally work with algorithms to uh, initiate new therapies, titrate those therapies, uh, and maximize the yield of chronic disease management. Uh, we built a basic clinical system uh, that does this. So we took the, the PAC systems and then just pulled all the data out, as you see, the AI-based work that we did before is very useful in this setting uh, and is highly reproducible even across AMCs. Uh, we also built a series of clinical algorithms breaking down normal clinical care into a series of steps. Uh, so the uh, traditional management of LDL, for example, is about 1,200 steps. Blood pressure is a considerable degree more complicated. Uh, but what we've tried to do is break it into a set of individual inputs, the priors, the intervention, and then the outputs. Uh, that allow you really to task shift at massive scale to undertake diagnosis, medication initiation, monitoring, and coaching, uh, and actually capture the transitions uh, of the patient at each of those steps. Uh, this allows you to build uh, reusable modules that uh, can be uh, adapted for almost any condition. Uh, and so far, we've done this in uh, blood pressure, lipids, and in heart failure, taking fairly straightforward single metric uh, in uh, guideline-driven uh, events, as well as more complicated multi-metric uh, uh, chronic diseases with higher risk, uh, although still all in the outpatient setting, where we can use uh, AI to identify the right patients. We can now actually identify who's even amenable to being uh, introduced to this type of program, white label uh, a lot of the activities through the provider, and then using program navigators really uh, allow all of the care to exist uh, before the uh, provider uh, sees the patient next. It's really a, a Coumadin clinic for chronic disease uh, and can be adapted to about 50 to 60% of all uh, primary care and secondary care uh, in our uh, initial estimates. Uh, we've executed this in uh, several uh, thousand patients in most of the settings. Uh, uh, we've basically taken uh, in blood pressure, we're able uh, to achieve uh, across now over 9,000 subjects, uh, a consistent uh, uh, 18 to 20 millimeter reduction in systolic. Uh, the diastolic reduction is about 13. And LDL, and these are all individuals who are in chronic primary care uh, already and have had on average two and a half to three and a half visits uh, in the previous, uh, per year in the previous two years. Uh, and what we've been able to identify is in even those well-managed and very commas patients, uh, we get about a 93% lipid, 93% uh, patients at goal with about a 40% lipid reduction in 12 weeks, blood pressure about 85% by seven weeks, reducing costs by about 68%. And the pop-off to physicians is about one uh, in every 100 individuals for blood pressure. It's about three in every thousand for lipids. Rare disease is a little bit more difficult, uh, but it, it still is uh, directly feasible. Uh, we've done this uh, in a very extensive way in our uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction population, and again showed uh, about a 20% increase 
uh, in the ability, uh, a 20% increase in those who are at goal, uh, both for the number of medications and the dose of medications and guideline directed clinical therapy. And this one, uh, I've, again, the citations seem to have dropped off because they were in a different format, uh, but this was all published. This was in JAMA Cardiology and the prior work was in circulation in the last uh, six months. We've also begun to try and enable patients to undertake complicated uh, activities um, on their own. One of the things that a lot of the geneticists in the audience will recognize is getting a family history. So we built a series of family history tools that really allow the, the patient and the family uh, to work together iteratively to identify other family members to then trigger phenotyping using QR codes that allow the providers uh, and the patients and the rest of the family to interact around collecting all of the information that you need in order to build a rigorous genetic risk score and in order to use genetics uh, in any meaningful way in management without having to undertake a massive training effort for all of primary care and all of cardiology on how to manage, uh, how to initiate and manage the results of genetic testing. Uh, and so we've done this for cardiomyopathy and familial dyslipidemia so far, beginning to expand it into uh, arrhythmias and into uh, general medical conditions uh, as we speak. Uh, one of the things that all of this technology brings is a, a sense that we're gonna begin to move a lot of uh, what we do into very new venues for data collection. Uh, and we anticipate that this will happen much quicker than, uh, than we perhaps anti uh, did anticipate anticipate before COVID. We're already seeing a significant return to face-to-face -face visits, but a large proportion of the population, particularly those with high deductibles who are uh, digitally savvy, are really just not interested in coming back to face-to-face -face visits, in life, particularly for chronic uh, disease management. Uh, I think a lot of the implementation of this is also gonna require significant culture change in our part. Uh, a whole slew of uh, educational initiatives uh, built around just-in-time education at the patient interface, the data you need to capture and maintain in your, in your head have long since exceeded the capabilities of an individual physician. Uh, we need to begin to train for new clinician roles. And we've started uh, an innovation uh, effort in, in fellowship and in residency here at the Brigham, uh, really trying to direct a lot of our folks in, in new ways. Uh, this I built because in the last year that I was chief of cardiology, half of our fellows went direct to industry rather than going into uh, academia, and the majority of the, them went into digital uh, entities in healthcare. Uh, we're going to need very dramatic changes in responsibility. One of the things that we've been struck by is that all the patient engagement, all of the self-care dramatically improves, even without formal coaching, patient engagement. And we have a publication measuring that uh, in press. And then finally, I do think uh, we need to begin to rethink the academic industrial interface. Much of what I've described today is completely dependent on massive scale. If you talk to the folks uh, at Uber, they say they didn't really see any benefit from AI until they had 100 million transactions per day. And most medical systems are vanishingly data poor and vanishingly transaction poor in that uh, scale. So I think you're going to see a, a remarkable change in in how this boundary gets blurred, not least because of the enormous scale uh, of funding as well as data flows that are going to be required. Ultimately, I hope we can begin to piece together the elements that I showed you this morning into a truly learning system where the um, platform we use for evidence generation, the platform we use for management and clinical activity is actually the same one. Uh, ideally, that would be something uh, that would accelerate the innovation cycle dramatically. Uh, and that's something we're trying to implement in real time. Um, in summary, I, I have tried to uh, briefly convince you that medicine is non-systematic by design. Most of the things that we complain about are things that we put in place. Uh, Organ-specific subspecialties are already an anachronism and technology is accelerating innovation. The need to re redesign care and redefine disease are actually remarkable opportunities for each other. Uh, creating systems that learn is reproducibly feasible. Our very simple initial efforts had dramatic effects to the point where our uh, IDN implemented them across the entire uh, population for population health management within uh, six weeks of us finishing our pilot. Uh, and then finally, I do believe that systems for care that no longer require professional intervention 
can rapidly lead not only to much more efficient optimization around guideline directed or other goals, but also to the reprofessionalization and reduction in burnout that we all crave. Um, obviously, uh, lots of acknowledgements for this. I'm going to highlight only a few. Thanks to uh, Jean Beasley for her work helping me organize this, Jean Navon for the invitation, the Center for Cardiovascular Research and the Division, and Nate for the introduction. Uh, the main work that I described was done in partnership with Rahul Deo and Juan Di Zhu. Uh, we have a ton of folks here, particularly Shinichi Goto uh, uh, and Max Hamilius, who work really hard on the machine learning, uh, and then the innovation teams on the care delivery uh, down at the bottom right. And thank you all for your attention. Cal, Cal, thank, thank you so much. That was a, a whirlwind tour. Um, really fa fantastic. Um, I'll, uh, I'll let some, so if, if anybody has any questions, you can type them into the box and I'll, I'll facilitate. Um, Calum, I'll just start things off. Um, you know, I think that was a really, uh, a wonderful example of, of highlighting the fact that we've been looking under this, the lamppost, right? So we look under the lamppost because that's where the light is, not necessarily that's where the answers are. And I think you've, you've really shed, um, light, no pun intended on, on opening up new, new lampposts and new ways, ways to look. And, I was struck by your piezo one example, where there's a molecular endophenotype that underlies hematologic, um, um, metabolic, and cardiovascular disease. And so, to what extent do you think that's going to be the the rule or the exception that these molecular endophenotypes link disease categories? I I actually strongly believe that they will, just from the initial work that we've done, which is very focused in the cardiometabolic space. Uh, but one of the most interesting things that we've identified is that a lot of these um, traits, these endophenotypes really don't obey any of the, disease, the traditional disease boundaries. So you have folks who look like they're on the margins of um, diabetes who have uh, neurological uh, and other endophenotypes um, that are related to chronic kidney disease, but never develop diabetes, uh, at least as we define it. I'm sure in, under some circumstances, they will have primary abnormalities of uh, the way that they handle glucose, uh, but the reality is they would not meet any diagnostic criteria for diabetes. And in fact, I think you know one of the things we're seeing in this space, and uh, I alluded to it in that first case, is that what's breaking down these boundaries is not us because we continue to look under the lampposts. It's actually drugs that cross the boundaries. So things like uh, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, and naprilysin inhibitors, where suddenly you know, you're seeing effects on renal dysfunction or metabolic dysfunction with an epilysin inhibitors or heart failure with the SGLT2 inhibitors uh, that you would not have anticipated from the disease categories that you're looking at. And so I think it will turn out to be a pretty broad and universal phenomenon. I'd be surprised if, it, I mean, we, we, we have explored so little of the phenotypic space. I'd be stunned if it isn't a generalizable feature. So there's a question, Callum, um, how will community physicians keep address, keep abreast of these new and exciting changes to, to sort of participate, learn about um, these new systems? So one of the things I think that's super interesting in this is that it's very well aligned. It's one of the reasons I was honored to, to be the Massey lecturer is that type of bedside observation is really what drives a lot of the insights. And I think one of the things that we've done is we've sort of, uh, through electronic health records, which now make documentation about 90% of the encounter, through uh, the, uh, the dissipation of the face-to-face -face encounter, uh, because we're trying to meet metrics, we've removed the ability of the individual physician, uh, clinician, patient interaction to generate hypotheses. And I, I actually think that in the long run, that's gonna be one way that uh, physicians will interact. I think the other way that's gonna really be part of it is that the generalist will be elevated. The individual who's patient-centered will be elevated. Uh, and I think that's something that we're already seeing uh, is super important. Uh, and then the patients themselves will be the, the story that, will, that binds everything together. So uh, that combined with technologies that will help uh, with just-in-time education, some amazing tools where you can combine you know, at, the, at the patient bedside education uh, with actual CME uh, um, uh, accomplishment. All of those types of things will start to create the, the space for professionalization that I hope will uh, empower physicians and patients alike. We're, we're rapidly running out of time, but maybe we'll just wrap it up with one last question by, by Dr. Mann. So he, he's, he's wondering, 
um, to what extent are these scalable and reproducible? So, so you've got a study in Boston um, with a certain set of patients and do those findings and, um, and discoveries, are they generalizable to patient populations, for example, in other parts of the country, other parts of the world? So Doug, thanks for that question. Exactly as you point out, you, you really need to think about how you're uh, transferring the learning from one setting to another. So this is one of the reasons I believe that scale will be important. You're gonna break down the differences between individual areas. We have found that with a very modest amount of transfer learning, it's possible to move the programs, for example, from the Brigham uh, to unaffiliated hospitals in Eastern Massachusetts. But your point is well taken. Eastern Mass may be itself a unique ecosystem. So I, I think we have to really be careful in, in that regard. And again, it's one of the reasons why this is gonna be an ongoing and iterative process rather than a sort of one and done. But a great question and thank you. Good to see you. Callum, thanks so much. We'll uh, give you a virtual uh, round of applause. And Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks all, stay safe. Cheers, Nate.